Good evening. On behalf of Loyola Marymount University and Commonweal Conversations, welcome to you all. Bienvenidos a todos. Um, I'd like to introduce our, my colleagues, our team. Uh, that includes uh, Father Alan Figueroa Deck of the Society of Jesus, Dr. Cecilia Gonzalez Andrew, Dr. Robert Herto, and Mr. Leonardo Mendoza. I'd also like to introduce our simultaneous translator for the evening, the talented Carmen Aguinaco, who is multicultural specialist of the US USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Secretariat of Divine Worship. So um, at this time, I would like to present to you Elsie Mares, who is vice president of the Associated Students of Loyola Marymount University. Hola y gracias por acompañarnos esta noche. Yo soy El Cimares y soy vicepresidenta del gobierno estudiantil de Loyola Marymount University. Es hermoso vernos aquí juntos como comunidad, aunque no sea en persona, para explorar la responsabilidad social y qué significa votar como católicos. Esta es una conversación crítica que se debe tener en este momento, y para los jóvenes como yo, tiene gran importancia. El voto de este noviembre, no solo presidencial, pero por representantes e iniciativas locales, estatales y federales, afectará muchis, muchísimo la calidad de nuestras vidas y las de las próximas generaciones. Antes de comenzar, quiero agradecer la generosidad, quiero, quiero agradecer la generosidad de nuestros patrocinadores patrocinadores que hacen que ese momento comunitario y sin fronteras es posible. Gracias especiales a la oficina del presidente del ALEMIO, a la Academia del Pensamiento e Im Imaginación Católica, al Government College of Liberal Arts, a la oficina de Campus Ministry, Minista Ministerios Estudiantales, el programa de Cat Catholic Studies, Estudios Católicos, al Centro para la Espiritualidad Ignacia, al Centro para Reconciliación y la Justicia de las Hermanas de San José, a la División de Asuntos Estudiantiles de nuestra universidad, a la Comunidad Jesuita, a la Oficina de Misión y Ministerios de LMU, a la Catedra de T. Mary Chilton en te Teología Católica, a nuestro insignia Escuela de Leyes Loyola Lasco, y de manera muy especial a nuestros amigos de la red de vista Commonwealth. Sin más preámbulo, me gustaría presentarles a alguien muy especial para todos nosotros, nuestro presidente. Dear guest, thank you for being here this evening. And now, let me present to you the 16th president of Loyola Marymount University, Dr. Timothy Law Snyder. Thank you, Elsie. Muchas gracias. I thank the LMU Center for Religion and Spirituality, the LMU Latinx Theology and Ministry In Initiative, and Commonweal Magazine for joining us to, uh, actually joining together to bring us this timely lecture. Many colleagues brought today's gathering to life and they all deserve our gratitude, including those about to give it kinetic life, and again, today's respondent, Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid, T. Marie Chilton, Chair of Catholic Theology, and our moderator, Dr. Brett Hoover, Associate Professor and Graduate Director of Theological Studies, both at LMU. We welcome all our colleagues and our friends, including trustee and our Jesuit Communities Rector, Reverend Eddie Siebert, Society of Jesus. We also have with us former Rector, Alan Deck, and we extend a warm lion welcome to tonight's feature and guest lecture, Ambassador Miguel Diaz. Ambassador Diaz, we are honored and grateful to have you with us speaking to a topic that invokes as much enthusiasm as it does anxiety. We welcome you to LMU, where I, I'm, I'm compelled to inform you we are experiencing 72 degree weather uh, we do have a little heightened pollution from the wildfires, but we know that in Chicago you have gale warnings in addition to your 49 degree temperatures. So just, just a little bit rubbing it in, but also to invite you to come be with us physically when health conditions permit so, welcome. 
I am sure most of you are at least aware of Pope Francis's latest encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, and its profound connections to today's topic. With urgency, Pope Francis calls on us to heal divisions and care for one another, essentially to appeal to the better angels of our nature. And with Pope Francis, of course, we can do this in many ways. With the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Pope invites us to identify with the vulnerability of one another and to be there for and with one another. When LMU hosted the Democratic National Debate last year, we were proud to carry on our tradition of rigorous debate and civic engagement and to demonstrate our responsibility as a Catholic university in navigating disagreement and in honoring differences while pursuing solutions that ultimately benefit the common good through transformative ideas and conversations, through listening, through engaging, and through meeting people where they are, we understand that we can and must always do all we can for those here, for those to come and for the earth itself. Doing more requires that we speak up when we encounter injustice, requires that we learn from our mistakes, and it requires that guided by our love for God's greatest gifts, one another, that we strive for a universal communion. Of course, with the presidential election in our midst already started, one of the easiest ways for us to express our voices and be heard and to look out for our neighbors as well is to vote. And not just to vote, but to be informed voters and to help others be informed as well as we do our part to create that human future in which we can all thrive. We should note that to be granted this responsibility is sacred. It's not one we have always had as citizens of our nation. It is not one all of us have as dwellers of our nation as persons born for all intents, purposes, and experiences as American. This is sacred. So I invite each of you to visit lmu.edu slash vote. That's lmu.edu, vote, to learn more about LMU's role in keeping our community engaged and informed. And this site has a lot of faculty expertise on it. And it also describes how the university is serving as an LA County official early voting center. So because I know we always have students, I checked, we have students logged in here, I'm really pushing you to vote because I do not want you to have an experience that some of us um, who are a bit older have had through our lives. And that is experiencing 364 times, well, 365 times four uh, days to come where you say, I wish I had voted. So let's be part of the solution. Let's do it together and let's enjoy our evening together. Welcome to each of you. Thank you. Thank you, President Snyder. Uh, my name is Brett Hoover. I'm an ally member of the LMU uh, Latino Theology and Ministry Initiative that the President mentioned, and I teach pastoral and practical theology. Um, I'm now tasked tonight with introducing our distinguished speakers. I have the great privilege and honor of presenting to you Dr. Miguel H. Diaz, who is the John Courtney Murray University Chair in Public Service at Loyola University Chicago. He was the ninth United States Ambassador to the Holy See from 2009 to 2012, the first Latino and theologian to serve in that role. Up to that moment, uh, Dr. Diaz had been a distinguished, had had a distinguished career teaching theology, serving on the faculty and then as dean at St. Vincent Seminary near Miami, and also at Barry University in Miami and St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. 
President Barack Obama's appointment of a theologian as U.S. ambassador to the Holy See likely raised some eyebrows in uh, the world of diplomacy. But how many foreign service officers uh, could make reference to the Chalcedonian grammar of Catholicism, referring to the Catholic tradition's emphasis on distinguishing but not separating faith from reason or nature from grace? Considering he was called upon to represent the United States to another theologian, Pope Benedict XVI, the fit was very good indeed. As U.S. Ambassador, Professor Diaz was a bridge builder, arguing that the world of diplomacy needs the world of religion in order to advance the common good, while religious leaders need diplomats for their expertise on world affairs and their art of the compromise. His was a skillful voice of mediation, between what might be understood as the world's largest hard power, the United States, and the world's largest soft power, the Catholic Church. And at a time when internal crises in both the US and the Catholic Church seem to urge not engagement, but rather postponement of new initiatives. Ambassador Diaz, who came to the United States from Cuba as a refugee at the age of nine, received his PhD in Systematic Theology from the University of Notre Dame. He is a former president of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the United States, which awarded him the prestigious Virgilio Elizondo Award in 2013. He is also the recipient of several honorary doctorates. Professor Diaz is the author or editor of several books, including On Being Human, more recently, The Word Became Culture, disruptive cartographers doing theology latinamente. His forthcoming book is entitled Building Bridges, God, Diplomacy, and the Common Good. Other work bridging faith and public life includes serving as a consultant for media outlets from CNN and CNN en Español to the BBC and Fox News. His articles and interviews have appeared in many journals and magazines. I've also been told by very reliable sources that the ambassador is an impressive dancer. He was apparently cited uh, salsa dancing at the Catholic Theological Society of America meeting in Puerto Rico in 2016. Sadly, our online modality does not allow for a demonstration. I believe that one of his dance partners at said occasion may have been our respondent, and I am also privileged to present to you Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid. Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid is the T. Marie Chilton Chair of Catholic Theology at, here at Loyola Mar Marymount University. She is the second person to hold that chair after it was inaugurated by Father Thomas Rausch of the Society of Jesus. Dr. Pineda Madrid has an international reputation in global feminist theologies and she has previously served as the Vice President of the International Network of Societies of Catholic Theologies, which has the amusing acronym INSECT. She has lectured around the world, Mexico, Argentina, India, Germany, and, uh, um, and she has also served, like uh, Ambassador Diaz, as President of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the United States, and has received from the Catholic Theological Society of America their prestigious Anne O'Hara Graff Memorial Award. A native of the border community of El Paso, Texas, and an alumna of Loyola Marymount University, Professor Pineda Madrid received her doctoral degree in systematic and philosophical theology from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. She is the author or editor of several books, including her most famous work, Suffering and Salvation in Ciudad Juarez, a clear-eyed examination of the terrible violence of feminicide, which challenges our traditional understandings of salvation. She's also authored many articles. So on behalf of the LMU uh, um, Latinx Theology and Ministry Initiative, I welcome both of these distinguished speakers and I hand over the proceedings to Ambassador Diaz as he addresses us tonight on a very timely topic, viruses tart the target the vulnerable and no no borders social responsibility and voting as a catholic thank you brett for this wonderful introduction um i can assure you that i i believe that my uh sources have already notified me uh 
as to who that person uh, was that told you about, um, about my dancing um, skills in the, you know, as we, as that person, of course, uh, exhibited quite a talent too in the beautiful island of Puerto Rico. So thanks so much really for, for um, that excellent way in which, uh, you know, you, you have in, introduced us to this, uh, to this evening. And I want to uh, add my word of gratitude to President Snyder for um, everything that you've uh, stated tonight, as well as the, you know, your, your service to the community of LMU and, and all who participate in the student body and faculty over on the West Coast. You are correct to say that I'm a little tempted uh, to uh, fly across the country because in fact, we are supposed to hit the 30s uh, tomorrow and we do have that gale warning. And it's very, very tempting, uh, especially for a Caribbean guy like me to, uh, to want to get on that first plane and, uh, from O'Hare and come uh, visit you um, physically. I, uh, sadly, of course, we know that that's not possible at this time. I also want to add my word of thanks to Elsie Maris, uh, to Carmen, and the wonderful translation that she will provide for all of us tonight. I also, in addition to um, you know to uh, these um, you know uh, these voices and these persons, I want to add my um, my gratitude, you know, to Bob who has been um, incredible uh, during this process, uh, as well as to Nancy, uh, to Cecilia, and to Alan, who um, you know who I count as my friend and have known for for many many years, as well as of course to all of the members of the uh, um, Jesuits and the uh, community over in the West Coast who have been so gracious and hospitable in welcoming, in welcoming me to this, uh, to this event. And last, of course, but not least, I wanna thank all of you who are uh, in your homes, uh, wherever you may be, whatever coast you may be joining, I want to um, you know, really express from, uh, you know, from my heart a word of thanks um, and, and, and also pray that you and your families, loved ones and friends are staying safe during these very difficult times. And so um, with, that, uh, with that word of thanks, um, I'd like to begin my presentation tonight. This past summer, I was asked to submit, and I believe Nancy and Bob called me, was asked to submit to LMU a title and abstract for my talk this evening. As many of you have already seen from the flyers, the title I proposed was Viruses Target the Vulnerable and No, No Borders, Social Responsibility and Voting as a Catholic. The description I provided reads as follows. During this time when our nation has experienced an unprecedented health crisis resulting from COVID-19, we have become increasingly aware of the Catholicity of the human family, its interdependence on matters of health and wealth, and its human vulnerabilities. We have always known that viruses, whether biological or social in nature, don't discriminate on the basis of national borders, creed, and other human markers. But today, we can no longer turn our backs on the following fact. Viruses pose the greatest threat to life on bodies left weakened from years of social injustice and discrimination. This keynote offers a Catholic theological reading of viral challenges facing our nation in the social responsibility that must shape our consciences as we vote in our upcoming presidential state and local elections. Little would I know then when Nancy and Bob called in Cecilia that the subject I chose to address would resonate on a personal level. Three weeks ago, I was having dinner when I noticed a strange sensation in my mouth. Half of my mouth and lips felt as if I had, if I had gone to the dentist and gotten a Novocaine shot. The right side of my mouth and tongue and cheek felt numb. As I tried to drink, and, and as I tried to bring some liquid into my mouth, it was very, very difficult to do so. 
I put food in my mouth, but it was nearly impossible to chew from the right side. I went and looked into the mirror and noticed the right side looked crooked. And then I realized I could no longer produce a straight, uh, a straight smile. I still can't. My first thought was, oh my God, I'm having a stroke. I turned to Michael and Irene, two very special souls in my life for some answers. Irene, who is a medical doctor, asked me to send some pics. Michael recalled how his boss, Mick, had experienced a similar facial paralysis, had gone to the ER room at a hospital thinking he was also having a stroke, only to diagnose, to be diagnosed by doctors with Bell's palsy. As was the case with Mick, doctors also confirmed for me that my facial paralysis was not caused by a stroke, but instead by a viral infection associated with Bell's palsy. I'm sure you are wondering what my personal experience has to do with the subject of my keynote tonight. What does Bell's policy have to do with viruses knowing no borders, but targeting the vulnerable? Well, the answer will not surprise you. While there are still many unknowns when it comes to understanding the medical conditions that trigger Bell's policy, there's general medical consensus that a virus, usually the same virus that causes cold sores, triggers an inflammation of the seventh cranial nerve. Paralysis occurs when the virus attacks this nerve that controls the muscles on one side of your face. The specific relationship to human vulnerability comes because an opening for this viral attack often occurs when a person's immunity has been compromised. Stress, among other things, makes our bodies vulnerable and enables this virus to target our bodies. And as I am sure you will all attest, these are stressful times for all of us. Civil unrest, unemployment, physical uncertainty, political, homeschooling, isolation from family and friends, wildfires in California, and hurricanes in the Gulf Coast. Many of us are just plain numb in the ongoing challenges we and others around us face. This evening, my friends, I come to explore with you the relationship between individual and social viruses and the ways they can target the most vulnerable. I do this mindful of how COVID-19 has indiscriminately targeted particular persons and communities in our nation and aware of the racism and xenophobia which undermine the well-being of our nation. As Pope Francis underscores in his recent encyclical, racism, and I would argue xenophobia and other social forms of oppression, are like, quote, a virus that quickly mutates and instead of disappearing, goes into hiding and lurks in waiting, end of quote. My focus is primarily theological. Though arguments abound from psychological and sociological perspectives that explore the relationship between social economic marginalization, living in unsafe environments, and mental and physical illnesses. In many of these cases, physical and mental illness comes about from systemic and structural practices sustained by powerful economic, social, and political forces. In envisioning the relationship between individual and social viruses and the need to care for the most vulnerable among us, I rely both on biblical and theological traditions. Consider St. Paul's metaphor of the body of Christ and his claim that, quote, 
the body does not consist of one member, but of many, end of quote. And more specifically, as it concerns this keynote, St. Paul's argument that, quote, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect where our most respectable members do not this, do not need this, end of quote. Theologically speaking, consider also the central teaching of Christian faith, the doctrine of the Trinity, and its affirmation that human persons are called to exist as the divine persons exist. Theologians across generations in theological traditions have affirmed that what constitutes and characterizes divine life is its interdependent, relational, and communal nature. Created in God's image, human persons are called to exist as social creatures, acting responsibly for the sake of health, of not just their individual bodies, but also of their social bodies. That is, the social political communities that inform their corporate personality. Pursuant to the goal of mining the relationship between individual and social realities, the life-threatening impact of viruses on the most vulnerable, and the social responsibility we have to exercise during this upcoming election, this keynote will explore two things. First, a reading of the signs of our times that focuses on the threat of viruses that disproportionately impact certain individuals and social bodies more than others. And two, a theological exploration of these viruses, drawing wisdom from the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe, primarily associated with Mexicans and Mexican Americans, and the story of Our Lady of Charity, primarily associated with Cubans and Cuban Americans. The keynote concludes with some implications of this teaching for civic life and proposes some questions to consider as Catholics in the upcoming election. My basic argument is as follows. God's grace or charity, understood as solidarity with the most vulnerable, is the fundamental Christian teaching that the stories of Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Charity convey. It is also a teaching underscored in Pope Francis's new encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, as a signpost for political life. This teaching must guide how Catholics vote in the upcoming national elections. Signs of the Times, viruses and their attack on vulnerable bodies. In one of his most celebrated and cited passages, the Second Vatican Council declares, at all times, the church carries the responsibility of reading the signs of the times and of interpreting them in light of the gospel if it is to carry out its task in language intelligible to every generation, she should be able to answer the ever recurring questions which men ask about the meaning of this present life and of the life to come and how one is related to the other. We must be aware of and understand the aspirations, the yearnings and the often dramatic features of the world in which we live. Any reading of the signs of our times 
which is mindful of the dramatic features of the world in which we live, would be hard pressed not to recognize the pandemic and its global effects on our human family. As of this writing, more than 1 million persons have died from COVID worldwide. In the United States alone, 7.5 million persons have been diagnosed and more than 220,000 persons have died. For comparison's sake, COVID has killed more Americans than any flu season since 1918. And in spite of numerous efforts from our highest elected officials to downplay and or dismiss the threat of this virus, it is clear that this virus continues to wreak chaos within our communities. Not even the President of the United States, the most protected and cared for leader in the world, has not been spared from contracting this illness. The pandemic has focused us to socially distance from one another and has caused our economy to crumble. It has targeted most aggressively the poor, the undocumented, the elderly, the brown and the black. But street protests following the death of George Floyd have made poignantly clear that our nation suffers from another kind of virus that equally threatens human lives. Floyd's last words, I can't breathe, have become the, nation, the mantra of thousands of martyrs who stand on the shoulders of giants, our fellow Americans who in the past marched for equality and human rights related to race, gender, sexual orientation, and workers' rights. The voices calling for change that we have now heard through this land echo the cries heard from places like Montgomery, Seneca Falls, the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, Stonewall, and of course, from right here, from over there in California, the voice of Cesar Chavez is fighting on behalf of migrants' labor rights. These trailblazers resisted social viruses and paved the way for the voices that today march in our streets, calling us to realize a more perfect union. Jesus' words and actions were not only intended to restore health and life to individuals. Jesus challenged social injustices of the Roman Empire that excluded persons based on their physical ability, gender, religion, and social status. The relationship between physical illnesses and social marginalization that the Gospels present us has been widely studied, especially from social scientific points of view. Take, for instance, Jesus' healing of a leopard in Mark 1, verses 40 through 45. While, while scholars might differ on how they understand leprosy in relationship to Second Temple Jewish society, many of these scholars have underscored and understood persons who suffer from Hansen's disease and other similar skin illnesses to have been socially shunned at the time of Jesus. Given various purity laws at play, biblical scholars have taken the view that skin illnesses were perceived to be a mark of impurity, thereby leading to ostracizing certain persons as social outcasts. From this perspective, Jesus' declaration to this man in this story in the gospel, be clean, Mark 1 verse 41, which leads immediately to his cure, is more than just a physical healing. It is also a sign that in Jesus, the reign of God breaks in history for the sake of denouncing the exclusion of persons, challenging 
the normal, the status quo, and healing social relationships. The connection between social and physical bodies and the ways the physical illnesses can be linked to sinful social and ecological structures has been made amply clear in our country during this pandemic. In a recent piece I wrote for the National Catholic Reporter, I highlighted the profound social and racial disparities, especially with respect to brown and black bodies that COVID has unveiled during this pandemic. As scholar and activist Kianga Yamata Taylor in the New Yorker observes, there is, quote, a new morbid twist on the old American aphorism, when white America catches a cold, black America gets pneumonia. When white America catches the novel coronavirus, black Americans die." End of quote. In a disturbingly similar way, Latinx communities have also been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The CDC has reported that Latino communities are hospitalized from the virus at four times the rate of white Americans. A recent report claimed that Latinos make 60% of the COVID cases in California. Similarly, in the state of Illinois, where I reside, Latinos have the highest infection rate more than any other ethnic or racial group. Why is this the case? because their bodies, our bodies, become prime targets as a result of pre-existing medical conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and some of the immunocompromised conditions like obesity and smoking. Adding insult to injury, the economic effects of the coronavirus have been brutal on Hispanics leaving many of them unemployed as a result of the financial hit experience in the service industry. Many of those who serve our restaurants, clean our hotel rooms, drive our Ubers, and service our plane in airports are members of our Latino communities. And as one article in the LA Times discussed, the price of being essential is that many Latino service workers are bearing the brunt of the coronavirus. Still, even more horrifying than these facts have been the growing and disturbing incidents of xenophobia in our country. We have seen this in incendiary language that fueled the latest destructive expression of hate at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas. That injustice led four of us, Latino theologians, to write a column for the National Catholic Reporter proclaiming en conjunto that hate is not welcome aquí. Perhaps the prime example of hatred and fear in our nation has been the unjustified practices of the U.S. immigration detention system, which has not only caged innocent children and separated them from their families, but as we now know, has become a vector for the spread of the pandemic. In a recent report, the Center for Migration Studies has documented the unjust detention lack of proper medical care, and tragic loss of life of undocumented immigrants in these detention centers. Latino faith stories that speak healing from viruses that attack vulnerable bodies. Christian faith rooted in the crucified and risen Christ beckons us to constantly mine our religious traditions in search of words of hope in the midst of challenging times. The late Karl Rahner, a Jesuit 
and perhaps the most influential theologian in the 20th century, argues that human persons are on the lookout for human words in which God's word can be heard. For Rahner, the human person is hearer of the word. Rahner's theology is one that affirms God's universal will to heal humanity through the always and everywhere offer of grace. Rahner's mystical-like affirmation of God's omnipresence invites us to search today for words of hope, even in the midst of our wintry-like pandemic. The stories of Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Charity offer culturally situated words and images that speak to this hope. Above all, they invite us to imagine how God's offer culture, they, they, they invite us to imagine how God's charity heals all physical and social illnesses. The story of Our Lady of Guadalupe is familiar to most Catholics living in the United States. Less familiar might be the story of Our Lady of Charity. In this section, I don't intend to provide a detailed analysis of the origins, historical developments, and theologies of each of these stories. Each of these stories has already been amply discussed. Rather, my purpose is to highlight a part of these stories that I find particularly relevant and capable of speaking to the signs of our times. To be more precise, I want to make the argument that each of these stories offers the possibility to affirm from the perspective of Christian faith that God never abandons vulnerable populations. Indeed, God's healing often arrives in history during unprecedented times marked by social upheaval that have left human bodies more susceptible to physical illnesses and distress. Juan Diego in the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Let's consider first the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe. The most well-known version of this story comes to us from a source known as the Nikam Mapawa. The Nikam Mapawa is a text that rose within colonial Spanish occupation and speaks to the encounter between Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe. The late Virgilio Elizondo argues that it is, quote, a careful and serious attempt to put in writing the memory of the prodigious events of 1531, end of quote. Written by a Nahuatl scholar in Nahuatl and for Nahuatl people, the story conveys how God's grace always and everywhere reaches us in cultural ways that we can relate to and embrace. The place of encounter on Tepeyac Hill, the landscape, the metaphors, and the symbols we find in this story all convey the incarnational nature of God's self-communication. Thus, the story of Guadalupe can be described par excellence as a story of grace, a story in which Guadalupe, Guadalupe serving as God's ambassador reaches out in human solidarity through flor y canto to liberate and heal a people. The story begins in Tepeyac, in Mount Tepeyac, a hill that evokes sacred traditions and cultural memories for the Nahuatl people. Juan Diego, the protagonist of the story, finds himself contemplating over the sound of beautiful birds. He proceeds to question his worthiness to be the recipient of such an experience and evokes his social cultural familial past. By chance, do I deserve this? Am I worthy of what I am hearing? Maybe I'm dreaming. Maybe I only see this in my dreams. Where am I? Maybe I'm in the land of ancestors, of the elders, of our grandparents, in the land of flower, in the earth of our flesh. Maybe over there inside of heaven. The plot of the story unfolds 
as Our Lady of Guadalupe encounters Juan Diego. She identifies herself with names associated with Judeo-Christian and Nahuatl religious traditions. She characterizes this child of Mexican soul as her most abandoned son, dignified Juan. For indeed, his people were not criminals and rapists, but rather themselves the victims of such atrocities brought about by the abuse of power during colonial times. Guadalupe fills Juan Diego with the grace of her presence and instructs him to go to the local bishop to request the construction of a new church. Of course, given his status as a colonial and oppressed subject, it is not surprising to learn that Juan Diego hesitates to acquiesce to her request. Beyond the internalized cultural and oppressive social conditioning that has reduced him to a nobody, a non-credible witness in the eyes of Spanish authorities, there is another reason he hesitates to follow her request. It is, this, it is this detail in the story that I would argue resonates well with the signs of our time. Juan Diego also resists to follow Guadalupe's request to go to the local bishop and ask him to build a new church out of concern for the health of his uncle who is physically ill and at risk of dying. Let's consider for a moment the possibility that the illness of Juan Bernardino, Juan Diego's uncle, symbolizes more than just a physical illness. As Elizondo argues, quote, the sickness of Juan Bernardino was certainly very real in itself, but was also representative of all the collective trauma exhaustion, and incurable maladies, psychological, social, spiritual, and physical, that had come with the conquest and that were destroying the various nations of Mexico." End of quote. We know that a highly infectious pandemic at the time of the Spanish colonization called smallpox, caused by two viral variants variola major and variola minor, as well as influenza and other viruses which targeted indigenous populations largely resulted in their demise. As is the case today, so was it then. The bodies of those made vulnerable as a result of social viruses become more susceptible to physical diseases. The story of Our Lady of Guadalupe has been fittingly described as a resurrection story. After three conversations with the local bishop, the roses that Juan Diego carries in his tilma become the sign of his credibility. Roses, Gifts from the Virgin he carries in his tilma miraculously turn into her image and become the sign of the bishop that enables his belief. Thus, the church that Guadalupe requests does get built. But let me be clear, building a new church is really more about birthing new relationships that include, first and foremost, the healing of vulnerable populations. In this case, and in this sense, the resurrection that takes place at Tepeyac is more about the coming into being of a new ecclesial reality than it is about putting together a new set of bricks. The physical healing of Juan Diego's uncle is significant because it anticipates the social healing of a people. It signals the divine will expressed through Guadalupe to reincorporate Juan Diego and his marginalized people 
into an inclusive body of communal relations. The words that Guadalupe proclaims to Juan Diego summarize God's care over those that suffer then and now from the interrelated effects of social and physical viruses. Listen and hear well in your heart, my most abandoned son. That which scares you and troubles you is nothing. Do not let your countenance and heart be troubled. Do not fear that sickness or any other sickness of anxiety. Am I not here, your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Am I not your source of life? Are you not in the hollow of my mantle where I cross my arms? Who else do you need? Let nothing trouble you or cause you sorrow. Do not worry because of your uncle's sickness. He will not die of his present sickness. Be assured in your heart that he is already healed. There is no doubt that our Latino communities continue to believe in the ongoing healing power of God's grace. For instance, in her title, in her chapter titled, Traditioning, the Formation of Community, the Transmission of Faith, Nancy Pineda Madrid highlights the personal story of one of her former students named Cecilia in a promesa that Cecilia's mother made to the Virgin of Guadalupe when Cecilia was six years old and doctors thought she was going to die. The mother made a promise that if she got well, Cecilia would not cut her hair until she was 14. Relating Cecilia's story to the promise Guadalupe makes to Juan Diego, Pineda Madrid writes, quote, Guadalupe first made a promise to Juan Diego that his uncle Juan Bernardino would be restored to health and would live. She also told Juan Diego that she wanted to remain with the people responding to their needs. This promise to remain, this promise of healing, not only includes Latina families like Cecilia's family, but it also includes other Latino families that suffer today from the physical and social viruses that plague our nation. Juan Moreno in the story of Our Lady of Charity. Similar to the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the story of Our Lady of Charity also speaks to the signs of our times. In a recently published piece titled Virgen de la Caridad, Save the United States, I offered some reflections on the origins and theological significance of this popular Cuban story. I provided the following historical context for those not familiar with this devotion. Devotion to Our Lady of Charity originated in the 17th century while Cuba was under the Spanish rule. Her birthplace was in the northern part of the island near El Cobre, a copper mining community where enslaved indigenous and black workers labored. The protagonist of the story is Juan Moreno, identified as a slave and portrayed as black in subsequent images. In 1687, he provided Spanish authorities with testimony detailing the finding of the statue of Our Lady of Charity earlier in his life when he was a child. This testimony was discovered in 1973 by the Cuban historian Levi Marrero in the archives of the Indies of Seville, Spain. Two things stand out for me in this story at this time. Juan Moreno, the African slave boy who serves as the protagonist and bearer of this popular religious tradition. And two, the place where the statue came to reside, a Spanish slave settlement from which we get some of the earliest healing miracles connected to this devotion. According to the testimony of Juan Moreno, around the year 1612, 
Moreno, along with two indigenous brothers named Juan and Rodrigo de Hoyos, set out to gather salt in the Bay of Nipe. Moreno recalls that as, a, as they rowed their canoe, they noticed the floating object, which appeared from afar to be a little girl. Once they closed in on the object, they realized it was a statue with the following inscription. Yo soy la Virgen de la Caridad. That is, I am the Virgin of Charity. They carried the statue into their canoe and brought her to Barajawa, the Spanish settlement where they resided. According to the testimony, the image, however, kept appearing and disappearing. And shortly thereafter, perhaps around the year 1613, Devotees and Sanchez de Moya, a Spanish leader of the copper mines near Santiago de Cuba, apparently carried the Virgin in procession to El Cobre, a nearby town in the mountains off the southern coast, where oral tradition suggests a young girl, Apolonia, also had a vision of the Virgin on, El, on Cobre Hill. It is beyond the scope of this presentation to explore in depth the religious and theological implications related to this Cuban and Cuban American devotion. Suffice to say that from the beginning and throughout Cuban history and the Cuban exile, Our Lady of Charity has been associated with healing and liberation. In this sense, we can see parallels between Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Charity. As the Cuban Bishop stated in 1987, our Lady of Charity first and foremost accompanies, quote, representatives of Cuba's most exploited and poor classes to indigenous and a black slave whom she fills with the joy of her presence, end of quote. Historical efforts to reconstruct the places where the statue of Our Lady of Charity resided after her discovery by Moreno and that the Oyo brothers strongly suggest that she was quote, placed initially in the chapel of the hospital for slaves, which, had, which was adjacent to the shrine in El Cobre, end of quote. Faith traditions that developed in this initial hospital chapel that housed her image, as well as those associated with more recent times, relate Our Lady of Charity to healing miracles and the preservation of human lives. She has been specifically invoked and associated with saving the human lives of Cuban exiles attempting to cross from Cuba into the Straits of Florida. Important to note too is the fact that similar to Guadalupe, who as I noted above is associated with more than just human healing, Our Lady of Charity is also connected to social political healings. And like Guadalupe, Stories originally associated with her also connect her with healing the land where conquer subjects dwell. For example, when Diego tells us in his testimony to Spanish authorities that after carrying the statue of Our Lady of Charity in procession, severe drop miraculously ended. Quote, and in an instant, the river grew and the drought ceased, end of quote. This connection among personal, social, and ecological healings should not surprise us. Life, as Pope Francis has underscored in his encyclical Laudato Si, is intrinsically linked in an integral ecology. And the greatest threat to life happens in communities where the poor and marginalized live. This relationship between the health of a landscape and the health of a people has become poignantly clear today during this pandemic. As Yvette Cabrera highlights in a recent article for Mother Jones, and I quote her, the COVID-19 pandemic it's not just a health crisis. It's an environmental justice crisis. The hardest hit populations are found in areas that are also overburdened by pollution, poverty, 
and illnesses such as obesity, diabetes, and cancer, as well as asthma and cardiovascular disease, end of quote. To summarize, the common theme that joins the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe and the story of Our Lady of Charity is charity understood as solidarity with the Juan Diegos and Juan Morenos of this world. As I stated at the beginning of my talk, Christian teaching orbits around the affirmation that God's grace, God's charity, takes human form in its solidarity with the marginalized and oppressed. La Morenita, as we affectionately call her, does not just appear to Juan Diego. She assumes his culture, identifies with his bodily and social realities, and Christifies him as her son. She makes Juan Diego a member of the family of God. Am I not here who are your mother? In so doing, Guadalupe invites us to welcome Juan Diego as our brother. And as siblings, those who like him share a similar experience of rejection. In a similar way, our Lady of Charity enters into solidarity with an oppressed, copper-minding community of Black slaves and indigenous people, offering them God's grace and hope in the midst of their colonial vanquishment. Yo soy la Virgen de la Caridad. I am the Virgin of Charity. What then are we to do with these popular faith traditions in response to the signs that mark our times? How should we translate this popular faith into civic and political responsibility? How should a Christian faith inform our vote? Voting Catholic, social responsibility to our vulnerable siblings. In his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, the Pope draws from Thomas Aquinas' teaching that describes the, quote, love made possible by God's grace as a movement outwards towards another, whereby we consider the beloved as somehow united to ourselves, end of quote. The Pope goes on to argue that the ultimate idea behind the word charity must mean that, quote, those who are loved are dear to me, they are considered of great value, end of quote. For too long, this nation has been caught up in cultural wars and social polarization. The wall along our southern border is a symbol. It is a symbol sy symptomatic of the indifference that plagues our nation. America is losing its soul because we have lost the ability to consider the gift and great value that others in our midst bring into our lives. The practice, the practice of social distancing and wearing masks, something we must now do in order to care for our neighbors, has in fact been something we have been practicing for the wrong reasons and for a very long time in this nation. Of course, I am not speaking about what we're doing now, but I am speaking about the unnecessary distancing and, and the walling of ourselves from others that grounds our racism, our sexism, heterosexism, and xenophobia, to name just a few. Pope Francis characterizes the practice of erecting such walls as a barbaric ideology that we must do everything, in his words, we must do everything to reject. Thus he writes, it is the territory of the barbarian from whom we must defend ourselves at all costs. As a result, new walls are erected for self-preservation. 
The outside world ceases to exist and leaves only my world to the point that others, no longer considered human beings, possessed of an inalienable dignity, become only them. Once more, we encounter the temptation to build a culture of walls, to raise walls in the heart, walls in the land, in order to prevent this encounter with other cultures, with other people. And then the Pope issues this stern warning. And those who raise walls will end up as slaves within the very walls they have built. They are left without horizons, for they lack this interchange with others. End of quote. Catholics must exercise their civic responsibility by tearing down walls that keep us from encountering our neighbors. We must vote socially mindful of the fundamental Christian principle to love our neighbors. And we must support policies that advance the care of the poor, the sick, the marginalized, and the undocumented. As our cherished popular faith traditions like the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe and the story of Our Lady of Charity convey, in the Pope's most recent encyclical invite us to consider, we Catholics must begin our discernment to exercise our civic responsibilities by considering the condition of those vulnerable members of our society. When voting, we must not single, we must not be single issue voters that only defend life in the womb. We cannot claim to be pro-life and vote to elect leaders that threaten the lives of so many and the very life of planet Earth itself. Both Guadalupe and Caridad are popular symbols of Latino faith communities. By popular, I mean that these faith expressions not only belong to and are part of a shared identity arising from social and cultural bonds, and I borrow that expression from Pope Francis, identities that link them to a pueblo, to a people. That's true, but they are also popular because they convey an intimate relationship between the life of God's grace and vulnerable populations. As such, they invite us as Latinos to exercise our civic responsibilities in a popular manner, namely mindful of communal needs and of those most vulnerable among us. I concur with Pope Francis's rejection of the sin of populism that enables some running for office to quote, exploit politically a people's culture under whatever ideological manner for their own personal advantage or continuing grip on power, end of quote. To turn this argument into a theological point, Guadalupe does not arrive as God's ambassador to exploit Juan Diego and his culture. Rather, she assumes it. And rather than holding on to power, she instead empowers him, his uncle, and his people. The same is true in the case of A Lady of Charity. In Fratelli Tutti, the Pope argues that charity quote, it's also civic and political, and he makes itself in every action that seeks to build a better world. It makes itself felt in every action that seeks to build a better world, end of quote. Social charity, writes Pope Francis, quote, makes us effectively seek the good of all people, considered not only as individuals or private persons, but in the social dimension that unites them, end of quote. Pope Francis succinctly captures the primary civic implication that can be derived from the stories of Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Charity 
when he argues that, quote, charity is the spiritual heart of politics. It's always preferential love shown to those in greatest need. It undergirds everything we do on their behalf, end of quote. In light of these reflections that have highlighted the signs of our times marked by COVID-19 and other viruses of a social nature, the central teaching of charity as solidarity derived from the popular stories that I have shared with you this evening of Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Charity and the vision for a fraternal political order that Pope Francis envisions for nations, including our own. The following questions should be considered as we approach national elections in this unprecedented time in U.S. history. Which of the candidates running for office at local, state, and national levels is best suited to address threats to all human life today? Which of these candidates takes seriously the threat of this pandemic and vows to be guided by scientists and medical professionals to do whatever is reasonably and humanly possible to protect us against this pandemic, especially those most vulnerable among us, brown, black, elderly, and immuno immunocompromised bodies. Which of these candidates recognizes the reality that our country is also experiencing an unprecedented viral infections rooted on age old racism and xenophobia and vows to act on this knowledge? And lastly, which of these candidates is most likely to support and empower the disempowered, give hope to the poor, and address social injustices like those that pertain to the caging of immigrant children and those children that increasingly suffer from the digital divide? In these weeks before our national election, let us pray ardently for our nation. Let's educate ourselves and others with respect to the candidates, policies, and issues that will be on our ballots. Take some time to talk to our neighbors, to your neighbors. Talk to strangers. Listen to the cry of human pain around us. There's nothing fake about this pain. But whatever else you do to claim your rightful place in this democracy, vote as if, as if life depended upon it. Your life depends on it. Our children's life depends on it. The life of the Juan Diegos and Juan Morenos of this world depend on it. All life in our planet, in our vulnerable common home, depends on it. Because life counts on those of us that can vote, we must not only vote, but encourage others to vote. This is our most basic civic duty and responsibility over the next few months. In their document on framing consciousness for faithful citizenship, the U.S. bishops could not have made the importance of civic responsibility and voting more clear. They write, and I quote them, it is important to be clear that the political choices faced by citizens not only have an impact on general peace and prosperity, but also may affect the individual's salvation, end of quote. Thank you so much to all of you, the LMU community, the Jesuits, and the Jesuit solidarity with the most vulnerable among us, and to each of you this evening for allowing me to share these reflections. May God bless you and your families. May God bless the United States of America.
and may God bless all peoples and nations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Diaz. Uh, thank you, Miguel, my good friend. Uh, we are so fortunate to have you with us here. And I, I know I speak from all of us here at LMU uh, with a word of gratitude for your leadership, the vision you've laid out for us, the insights, and, uh, and how you've helped us to think more seriously about the social virus that we are all suffering with in this time. Um, I also want to just add my own word of gratitude to all of my colleagues at LMU, certainly President Snyder and, uh, and Brett. And uh, while she's not an LMU colleague, she feels like one, uh, Carmen Aguinaco for her translations. And of course, Cecilia and Father Allen and Bob and Elsie, thank you all for uh, your support. Um, so I want to honor what Miguel has put forward with us with my own response to uh, what he's offered. And um, I'm titling my response, In a Time of Reckoning. We live in a time of reckoning, a time out of time. This time of reckoning is a time when we as a country, when we as Catholics, are called to give an account of ourselves. We're called to pause, to pray, to take stock of who we are. This time urges us to wake up, to take stock of what's happening in our country and in our world, to give an account of where we stand and what we stand for. Who are we as civic-minded persons living in the United States? Who are we as human beings? What account of humanness do our lives offer? Who are we as voting Catholics who believe in a loving, a just, and a merciful God? Ours is a time of political reckoning, of theological reckoning, of spiritual reckoning, of human reckoning. Will we strive to be our best selves? Will we muster the courage to stand up and step forward in trust? Or will we fall back from this moment in fear? In March of 1861, during a time when our country was on the verge of anarchy, thus a time of reckoning to be sure, in his first inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln called our attention to the better angels of our nature. The better angels of our nature, our very best selves. Will we today reach for our very best selves? In his lecture, Miguel Diaz shared the narratives of Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Charity as culturally situated words and images that encourage hope and that remind us that our Catholic faith teaches us that God never abandons a vulnerable populations. What an absolutely insightful reading he has given us. Allow me to build on his insight. I got that insight and it inspired me. And I want to address at this time a different popular devotion and its timeliness. I find it uncanny how this election falls amidst the time of Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, November 2nd, which we also know as All Souls Day. And of course, this is a time of All Saints Day as well, November 1st. This, we know that as Latinos that this is a time when we build altares in our homes, Adorn, we adorn them with pictures of our beloved family and friends who have already passed. We place the, their favorite foods on our, our altares. And we talk to them. We have conversations with our beloved dead. And this is a time that the veil separating life and death somehow grows thinner. For Catholics, this is a time for us to reflect on our larger purpose and the larger purpose of all that is. 
This is a time that serves as a kind of eschatological reminder. What is the ultimate purpose of our lives on this earth and at this moment? Why are we here? What is our purpose? Where will we stand? And as we remember the dead, we might consider, do the dead have rights? Do they? Do the dead have a right to be heard? Do the 211,000 now dead from COVID have a right to be heard? Do they have something to teach us about life? Diaz, in his work today, his central question is, what then are we to do with these popular faith traditions? Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe y la Virgen de la Caridad. What do we do with these traditions in response to the signs that, uh, that mark our times? How should we translate this popular faith into civic and political responsibility? How should our Christian faith inform our vote? And I would add, how might we translate Dia de los Muertos, this popular faith practice, with its eschatological vision into civic and political responsibility? Don't we need this much larger vision of who we are and what we're about? Diaz observes as well, he asks us, uh, and I quote, to consider the possibility that the illness of Juan Bernardino Juan Diego's uncle symbolizes more than just a physical illness, close quote. His illness might also symbolize a social and collective trauma. Diaz further observes that the Guadalupe story is one of social healing of a people. His words invite us to stand with the prophet Jesus Christ. With Jesus, we are invited to see and to denounce the reign of death. Consider, how are we to see clearly the moment we are living in now with its ever expanding reign of death? First, the failure of our national leadership to respond forcefully to COVID-19, 211,000 people who were with us, living with us here in this country one short year ago are now dead. And the dead bodies keep piling up. Second, the United States has inaugurated a new reign of terror, as Diaz reminds us, a new reign of terror, of evil and death with the detention of tens of thousands of migrant children at our southern border. Mexican and Central American children separated from their parents and families. This separation will traumatize these children for decades to come. For some, perhaps for their whole lives. This was done in our name here in the United States. And I am deeply angry and ashamed of this. Third, the killing of brown and black men and women on the streets of US cities by corrupt and immoral police. Far too often they enjoy the cover of impunity. The August 2019 killing of 22 people of Mexican descent in El Paso, Texas by a deranged white supremacist. Is this country continuing to be a haven for white racial supremacy? Fourth, the wildfires burning here in California and all along the West Coast, with more to come, we're told, all caused by climate change and, cl and global warming, all part of an expanding reign of death. How will this be healed? Now, obviously, it goes without saying that there are many, many good people in this country. However, there comes a time when we must bear witness to what is erupting all around us. Remember, our God is the God of life. In 2017, I edited a book, I co-edited a book on the Holy Spirit. As I was working on that book, a section of the creed that we pray each Sunday mass took on greater meaning for me. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. Today, I do believe, today we have to ask ourselves, do we believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life? In 1971, a Catholic activist by the name of Eileen Egan wrote, the protection of life is a seamless garment. You can't protect some life and not others. Later in 1983, the, the late Cardinal Joseph Bernardine popularized this concept when he wrote, and I quote, those who defend the, the right to life of the weakest among us must, equally, um, must be equally visible in support of the quality of life of the powerless among us the old and the young, the hungry and the homeless, the undocumented immigrant and the unemployed worker. Such quality of life posture translated into specific political and economic positions on tax policy, employment generation, welfare policy, nutrition and feeding programs, and healthcare. And healthcare. This time of reckoning in which we are living today is one that invites us to consider, do we, do we believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life? As we prepare to vote, along with Miguel Diaz, I invite us to listen in his words, to listen to the cry of human pain around us, and to, in his words, exercise our civic responsibilities mindful of the communal of our communal needs and especially the needs of those most vulnerable among us to do so is to affirm that we do indeed believe in the holy spirit the giver of life thank you miguel for pushing us to think about this thank you so much mil gracias to you all gracias Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for these wonderful reflections. I, I, one of the marvelous things about this lecture uh, every year is that it, it, it's not only ideas, but also images, not only edification, but all, is also inspiration, not only asking us to think, but asking us to feel in the service of the gospel. So thank you both for doing. I'm not going to be able, until election day, I won't be able to get sent uh, Juan Bernardino suffering there and then healing from the virus out of my head. I won't be able to get away from the question of asking what the rights the dead have. So, so thank you both. We have some questions and, and we're gonna take a few moments here and, uh, and approach you both with some questions. So the, the first question I would like to uh, propose is one of our uh, um, audience members has noted, by the way, I do wanna say to our audience, you can still ask questions by uh, hitting the Q and A button. Um, one of our audience members has asked, uh, has noted that the Catholic vote uh, seems to be a bit evenly split today between the two political parties and asks if that split is due to the church not properly teaching its flock at, during their formative ages, or is it more due to Catholics putting their faith secondary to other concerns, national identity or their pocketbooks? So I, I leave that to either of you. That was not addressed to a particular person. Yeah, that's a great, you know, uh, you know and Nancy can, uh, can uh, you know, can jump in here. Um, that's a great question, and whoever asked that question, thank you very much. I think for a long time we have seen that there is a way in which the polarization in society uh, is also mirrored um, within religious bodies, including the Catholic Church. And so uh, it is very tragic and very sad that at times, um, you know, there are days that I wake up and, and, and as a Christian, I say we, we should be, we should do better than this. We, we ought not to be part of this kind of lack of civility, uh, polarization, uh, etc. So, so I, 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 uh, I, I think that it is not an, a simple answer. I think is, is, is uh, complex. Some of it is just has to do with the fact that we are not just, uh, you know, uh, 
we are to, to quote Augustine, we have this kind of like dual citizenship in both faith and, and politics. And oftentimes I do think that the political dimension um, has overtaken the faith dimension. And so uh, it is sad when, when we first are, you fill in the blank from a political perspective and, and we only then uh, consider ourselves or consider the perspectives that ought to be shaping and informing our lives as human beings, particularly if we are committed to those Christian values. Nancy? Yes, thank, thank you. I want to piggyback on what you're saying here, Miguel. I want to remind us that uh, of a couple of things. One thing that occurs to me is Pope Francis, you know, one of the great gifts of his papacy is that he's asking us to turn our, our, our vision outward about how the church has an impact and makes a difference in the world. Everything he's written, and Miguel helped us to see that in a lot of different ways, is turning our attention outward. And it's when the Catholic Church does that in this country, I think it inspires people and it drives people. And I, and I so I wanna put that on the, on the table. And I also wanna say that our Catholic Church has had histories when we've been very much involved in political justice um, questions in our country and, and have done so in a way that really speaks to, uh, to all Catholics and to young people where we get involved. And I, and I see us in a moment where we're moving into that again. But I, I mentioned that I realize you're asking about, you know, how well we educated uh, the younger generation. And I think, as Miguel said, I think it's complicated. I don't think there's a simple answer to that. But I think if we follow the Pope's lead, um, I think he, he, he gives us a clue in terms of where we should be headed. And, and there, just, just one more thing there, there um, you know, you mentioned Pope Francis, but of course he's, he's, he's following the, the, the very foundations of the gospel, the love of God and neighbor for crying out loud, the preferential option for the most, for the needy. When Lord did we see you when I was hungry and you gave me to eat? When I was thirsty and you gave me to drink, when I was in prison or, and, and you visited me, he, if Jesus was alive today, walking the streets, or well, he is alive, but if he was uh, walking the streets today, he would say, when I was an undocumented, when I was in those cages, there, Lord, whenever you did it to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. So, and so, so I, I think that we've lost, honestly, I think that, 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 that it is an evangelical question because we have lost touch with the centrality and the central teachings of our faith. And really the faith has become politicized and we have abandoned some of those central teachings. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think it's those central teachings that inspired me when I was in my early twenties to yeah. decide that I wanted to be a part of this church because it was making a difference in the world and boy, sign me up, you know? And that's what we need. We need to realize that and to recognize, yes, sign me up. So absolutely. Uh, Brett, sorry. Thank you. Thank you both. I, uh, and, it, it, and, and, yeah, and thank you for that uh, last uh, indication of uh, you know, encouraging the idealism of the young. That's beautiful as a professor. Um, uh, this question is addressed to, uh, to Ambassador Diaz. Um, the, the third person thanks you for your talk, Miguel. Um, can you elaborate upon your views on borders? What yep. would be a non-xenophobic love as solidarity to the most vulnerable U.S. immigration policy look like? Yeah, and so, so it's interesting. One of the things that struck me when I read um, Fratelli Tutti was so much emphasis that the Pope places on, you know, this concept of borders, right? And so, um, in fact, there's, there, there's a part of it that is quite radical because he's even talking about um, you know, as a result of these cultural shifts that have occurred globally, we really have to rethink the ways we, you know, he's not saying that nations don't have a right to, con you know, to, to, to um, uh, control their, their, you know, their, 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 their borders. He's not saying that we, we don't have a, uh, you know, that nations should all of a sudden not have that kind of, of, uh, of okay, the United States, Mexico, et cetera. But he's saying that, that, that clearly um, we have become too, too uh, focused, paralyzed. Um, and in fact, it's more than just the physical barrier that we have literally embraced this kind of culture that 
uh, that walls us from from one another. And so I, I think that the, um, the, the question about how do we both maintain uh, boundaries, proper boundaries, right boundaries, um, uh, right and just boundaries, but at the same time, don't make boundaries so tight that we create walls that really separate us from encountering others. I think that's the key question. Now, I don't know if I have the, the magic solution to doing that, but, but it certainly is not this kind of walling, both physically and uh, relationally, that we are engaged in, where really we are not encountering persons from different social classes, different religious perspectives. I mean, even in our neighborhoods, you know, sometimes they say that Sunday is the most segregated day of the week because we all are, you know, worshiping with people who, are, who share similar ideas politically, religiously, et cetera. So, so I think we have a lot of work to do whereby we keep proper boundaries, but at the same time, don't erect walls with each other. Okay, thank you, thank you. Did, did you want to add to that, Nancy, or? I think that's good, that's okay. very good, thank you. So uh, another question that somebody has, how can we balance the truth to defend all human life when Catholic authorities do not always share and push the faithful to embrace a single protection of life issue? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. Um, one that I asked myself, and I think that uh, under the papacy of Pope Francis, it's in fact, um, you know, just to piggyback on what Nancy was saying, you know, there are times in the history of the church where we feel more in inspired by, um, by ecclesial leaders who are closer to home, and there are other times where we may feel inspired by actually ecclesial leaders that are far away. This is one of those times that at times, what comes from Rome in this case, on this topic and on these issues is very liberating because as the Pope points out in this encyclical, I mean, he spends a lot in Fratelli Tutti, he spends a lot of time speaking about issues of life, but, but you know, he's not just confined to one issue. Uh, and in fact, he's, he very much speaks against the cultural wars that have become so much a part of our society. And, and so um, I would say that the, you know, that bishops, U.S. bishops, as well as other bishops who may not agree with this more inclusive approach to life, need to be start needs to start reading and really uh, embracing uh, Pope Francis's teaching. Thank you, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I'll, I'll just share a quote uh, from Pope Francis from his uh, Gaudate et Sulatate, which I think exactly speaks to that, that our defense of the innocent unborn, for example, needs to be clear, firm, and passionate. For at stake is the dignity of a human life, which is always sacred and demands love for each person, regardless of his or her stage of development. Equally sacred, however, are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned, and the underprivileged, the vulnerable, infirm, and the elderly exposed to covert euthanasia, the victims of human trafficking, <laughs> new forms of slavery, and every form of rejection. Yep. So I, I think how do we advance that kind of an idea? And how does that become more public in our discourse? And I think that's a task for all of us. It's a task I think that, uh, that all of us who teach theology share. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. I think that, um, We've really done a disservice to Catholic social teaching to, to you know, it really is a big disservice because what we've done is we've alienated ourselves from being able to contribute to the table with the best of our teachings, you know, and it's, it's because then we, you know, when they think about us, uh, you know, the, the, even, even, even internally, we think of ourselves in terms of single voting, voting issues or a single issue that defines who we are as Christians or who, how we should vote. And that's so against the essential yeah. of what it means to be a Christian and a Catholic. And, you know, you know, I oftentimes say, okay, so we can destroy the planet, which means we destroy all life. And that's okay. <laughs> uh, right? Yeah, exactly. No exactly. There's no logic to that. Yeah. No, it, there isn't. Uh, yes. Um, uh, another question that's come up, and I, I think that YouTube might be particularly helpful to us on this. When I look at the current state of dialogue in the public square, I feel that the Catholic voice has been caricatured. 
and Black and Latino Catholic voices are mostly absent or, or represented only outside of a faith context, you know, in a, in a political but not faith context. How might this sad situation be overcome? Well, <laughs> Nancy and I and others <laughs> in the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians um, of the United States uh, have tried and continue to try our best um, you know, to really struggle and fight that kind of marginalization because this is precisely the kind of, of stuff that goes on in families, right? And it, there's no difference here when it comes to, um, you know, we may say that we are the, we're, we're, we, we, we Latino are Catholics uh, and, and black Catholics, when you combine them really are the majority of Catholics in the United States. And yet we don't have, you know, um, no taxation without representation. We are certainly not well represented when it comes to um, institutions, when it comes to our perspectives, when it comes to being quoted, when it comes to being um, engaged. And so that's an ongoing battle, which by the way, <laughs> And I, and I think Nancy uh, would agree, you know, what we are experiencing in terms of the systemic institutionalized racism, you know, we know what this is about because we know that this are, you know, these are not just individual cases where Nancy is not quoted or where Miguel Diaz is not quoted or where, or where Carmen or where Jean-Pierre or where, and I can, where uh, Cecilia, these are really instances of a broader culture that really has to rec has, has to have some reckoning as you know in, in some ways as, as Nancy was saying we have to we have to come to terms with how it is that we really don't include don't want to include or that our structures are not yet ready to really allow for that diversity of opinion and voices even within our Catholic uh, family so it's it's it, it's it's a it's a challenge absolutely it's a challenge I think it's even more of a challenge here. And I wanna, I wanna now talk about being in Southern California. I taught for many years in the Northeast and now I'm back here in Southern California. And I think about how, you know, the Latino vote, the Mexican American vote and the Latino vote here in Southern California is so significant. And yet the visibility that puts that on the map is not quite there yet. We're, we're often called the sleeping giant. So when does that become, when do we awaken, you know, how do we wake up? And I think what Miguel was saying, I completely agree. There's a systemic marginalization of all of us. And, uh, and, and, I, and I think that we need to figure out more and more increasing ways that we put uh, our voices out there and we try to get heard in different, in different arenas. And I'm very grateful to uh, Loyola Marymount for doing exactly that with what we're doing tonight. Do we need we need to do this and more of it? Yeah, and I, you know it's it's uh it, it's it's baffling because when you think about the 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 the, the Latino a, a Catholic groups in this country, really, I mean, when I the, one of the first few times that I when I started teaching uh, Latino a theology. You know, I would quote Huso Gonzalez and, his, and, and, you know, it's like, okay, well, before the pilgrims landed, you know, before all of that, we already had Latino Catholicism in the United States. We had it in La Florida, the land of flowers. We had it in the West in terms of the missions. We had, in fact, before there was a, 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 the kind of, pil of Thanksgiving that came from the pilgrims, we had our Catholic Thanksgivings, Thanksgivings. you know, we had our Catholic masses, we had our, our offerings of things, of breaking bread, and, and, but all of that, I mean, I went through, through, through school in Florida, and I, I probably got a parent yeah, yeah. on all of that. Uh, I, yeah, I, I want to piggyback on that, because sure. you know, like, for example, in Puerto Rico, the very first Catholic bishop in what is today the United States was in Puerto Rico, and that happened in 1565, okay? Now, how many of us know that? And if you go to the website for the, not, not, to, not to diss the Archdiocese of Baltimore, okay, but if you go to the Archdiocese of Baltimore's website, they put on, they have a little line there, the first Catholic diocese in the United States. Now, obviously they were in what was the United States at the time. But, not, but that's not the way for us to think about this today. And I, and I think if you even look at the history of the missions in New Mexico and Arizona and California and, um, 
in Texas. And, and our missions, they date from this same period throughout the 16th, 17th century. And yet that's not part of our consciousness. And so we really need to do a much better job of turning around how we understand who we are as Catholics in this country. I, I, just, just you know, a, sorry, go ahead. You know, it's just a little anecdote. Um, um, right before I left Rome, um, you know, I, I, the ambassadors go and meet up with uh, Pope and say basically goodbye. And so one of the things I remember telling Pope Benedict was, well, you know, I may have been the first Latino uh, ambassador from the United States, but I certainly hope I'm not the last one. Because the, you know, it, it's simply, <laughs> simply because it, it really is, I mean, really, it's, it's one of those things that, that it's so rare for one of us to occupy any of these positions that when we right. do, it's sort of like, okay, well, is, it, is this just kind of like, oh, check, and now we kind of like check that we had our, our one, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not about that. I mean, we really need, uh, you know, we're not a threat to the United States. We're a gift to the United States. We are, you know, our own histories, traditions, popular religious expressions can offer much, not just to Latino us, but to the whole country as a whole. And, and, and I think that's, it's a loss. And I think that that's, that's the problem with walls. They keep us from encountering one another and they prevent us from encountering the particularity of another human being and the, the way that those human beings embody their own social, cultural uh, traditions, religious. Absolutely. Yes. I, I, just to kind of add to what you two are saying about the system, the systemic issues, I, I, I think we, you know, one of our co-sponsors is Commonweal and, uh, and, and I think the, the media is going through, right, some kind of reckoning, as you put it, Nancy, about, uh, uh, about the way they cover things and, and racial discrimination. And I, I, I think about how often are they asking Archbishop Gomez for comment instead of other bishops, just to give one example. Um, I think we need to call our, our media outlets to do that um, in, in the way that Commonweal is trying to do. So um, another question that is that there seem to be two perspectives on the gospel uh, generating the positions of Catholics as one of our questioners. Um, one is about social justice as the kernel of the gospel. The other is about Christian personal holiness. Hmm. The, sec the second option appears to be very individualistic. The, the former seems to be generated by Matthew 25. I is this an impasse? Is there something that can be done to bring these sides together? Yeah, I, I would say that that's, oh, no, no, go ahead. I, I would say that it's a distortion mm -hmm. uh, of what it means to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we need both. We need the interior. I need a personal prayer life. I need to pay attention to my interior. I need to be about worshiping God, praying, trying to discern what God wants of me. That is very important. And that very much is part of my personal journey and the personal journey of all Catholics. And every Catholic needs to be about that. Even those who are the most, uh, who, who maybe have much more of a, of a social or an outward vision of what it means to be Catholic. And by the same token, all the people who maybe tend and are more comfortable with paying attention to their inner personal uh, prayer life and their relationship, their personal relationship with God, those Catholics need to also be out on the streets and making a difference and being about the work of social justice. And any time that we polarize into either one camp or the other, we're distorting what it means to be Catholic. We've missed the boat here. And it's a very difficult thing to do because we're asking people to come into understanding a place of meeting and a point of intersection here that many of us may say, well, I'm more comfortable here or I'm more comfortable over there. And, and our maturity has to be about trying to find an integration. And that's where I would come at that question. Yeah, no, I, I don't have much to add to that except, except that found, foundational, again, to, to, to Catholic teaching is the social constitution of the self. And, 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 I, and I cited the more theological dimension, which is the Trinitarian notion that to be, is to be related. And, and so in that sense, um, it is not just about me, myself, and I. It's about, you know, how 
I cannot exist without the other. I, I always love the, 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 the Spanish word nosotros, right? We've, we reflect <laughs> upon that and theologically, because really um, the, the, the word that it literally translates into we, well, it, the, the we quite does not do justice to the nosotros, because the nosotros really captures this understanding that to be one, one must include others. One must have this kind of communal social reality that, that necessarily and essentially is part of who we are and become. And so the, I agree with Nancy 100%, this kind of, of, of polarization and, and, uh, uh, and, and dualism between the individual and the social is something that again, we've really missed the boat uh, in catechesis here uh, in big time. Yes. The, the, thank you. The theology of the human person from you both warms my heart. But, uh, um, <laughs> but I, uh, somebody else has asked, uh, with the church structure as it is, who should uh, promulgate, I think what the person means is publicize the encyclicals of Pope Francis, like Gaudete, or Laudate Si and Fratelli Tutti. Should we rely on the USCCB or should every diocese and archdiocese be, be kind of pushing these things? The people of God. <laughs> I'll answer with the Second Vatican Councils. Uh, I mean, it really is, this is part two of our responsibility, right? Um, it's not just the political dimension, but it's also the religious dimension. Um, you know, I, I speak to so many Catholics that really don't know these, these teachings and they're surprised to hear them for the first time, right? I, I, think, I, I think all of us, um, you know, theology is not just for people like uh, Nancy and, and Miguel and others. Y yes, we went through degrees and we acquired those degrees and there's some, some, special, there's some specialty that comes with that. But, but really, we are all called to be theologians. We are all called to be life learners. We are all called to both learn and teach. And I think that, um, you know, we, we will all be better if we don't just say, well, I'm gonna wait for a bishop or I'm gonna wait for a priest or I'm gonna wait for you know, so-and-so um, to teach me about X, Y, and Z, I think that there's also some kind of responsibility that, that we need to assume as baptized members of this body of Christ uh, in terms of both um, you know, what we learn and, and how we pass that on and, and, and what we choose and how we learn that stuff um, in, in how we present that to others. And so um, my three cents. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, what you were saying, uh, Miguel, I, like we should all be uh, posting uh, Fratelli Tutti on our uh, Instagram or uh, uh, Facebook, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And in this day of social media, this is part of the, well, I do this all the time, right? Because you know, the, the complaint is sometimes they say, well, he's, you know, he's doing a lot of this stuff, but, but the, the, the issue is too that we need to work within the cultures of our times, right? And so th this, this book that I, come, that I have coming up, uh, it's entitled, the word, became, you know, the word Became Culture, and it's precisely to underscore the fact that we need to engage the, our cultural realities. Mm -hmm. We need to do that because if we don't do that, we lose the place at the table. We lose our capacity to offer whatever is good for the sake of the common good. Um, and, and that's the thing, it's not that, it's, I'm not asking, at least I'm not asking that, you know, all of a sudden we become the only perspective at the table. Right. But we do have valuable perspectives and the we there includes the broader Catholic tradition, but also the particular Latino traditions that come from our different peoples and experiences. And I, I think that there's value to those traditions that can be shared for the sake of the whole. Thank you. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Uh, I, I, I think we're, we're, we're probably coming to our last question here, but uh, um, what, one of our, uh, our questioners shared a kind of heartfelt concern. Um, it's been hard talking about Black Lives Matter with my Catholic Latino family. With respect to racial justice and our call as Christians to call out the sin of racism, how do you recommend talking with our God-fearing and God-loving Latino families about anti-Blackness within our Latino culture? Yeah. I mean, I've wow. had, you know, we've all had, I think all, all of us have had those experiences. Um, to the, whoever the color is, if you look up my piece uh, uh, that, I, that I just cited on La, La Caridad del Cobre to save the United States in the NCR, I actually take that issue on um, because I speak as a Cuban American and, you know, and address the very Afro-Cuban roots and how in my own culture, 
you know, racism has been part of the family, you know, and by family, not only in terms of my own family, but in terms of the broader Cuban American uh, family, this is not something that is a monopoly just in one particular, <laughs> for one particular people. And I think that, that this is something that we are all struggling. Um, and, you know, personally, I'm getting increasingly impatient because it's sort of like for, for the lack of not shaking, you know, the, the status quo or not hurting a family member, then we just kind of like don't say anything. But all studies show that precisely silence, as Martin Luther King uh, you, it's, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, spoke about in his letter to uh, uh, Birmingham, uh, in, in, from the Birmingham Gap, yeah, this complicitness, this silence, that's where racism, in fact, can be more harmful. You know, he says, well, you know, th those that are white supremacists, we know where they stand, but it's the kind of complicit silence that, that really goes on in our families, goes on in our schools, goes on in our classrooms, um, that really begins to, to breed this kind of you know, in the words of the Pope, I love it because, you know, I, I, had, a, I had the title in the, in the talk all framed before the Pope issued the encyclical. And now he talks about racism, racism as, a, as a virus, right? That, that, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. grows, uh, grows silently. Well, I, I think this is part of the problem we all have to address. And, and I do think that this is exactly where our Catholic schools, you know, our Catholic teachings, our Catholic teachers, our Catholic families have not done enough to say, you know what? No, racism is a sin, period. The, whenever we, we, we put down another human being, regardless of you know, whether it's gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, immigration status, no, that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable. Uh, it's not acceptable in this family. It should not be acceptable in this family, should not be acceptable in this church. And I don't think we've done enough of that um, because, again, um, for and perhaps for fears that the you know that the that the that the contribution box might drop on Sunday or, or 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 who knows. But but I don't. I think we're at a at a point in society where, especially with our children, right, and with the young, the the young are going to look at us and they're going to say, well, you know, if you're not going to speak up, oh, fine, we'll walk out of the church. We'll walk out of these circumstances. Because we don't want to be part of that kind of, 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 of an ongoing um, structure that, that has precisely created the kinds of problems that we have inherited from your generation. So I, I really think we have to find ways, compassionate ways, but we have to find better ways to address these issues because clearly they're not going away and they're real. They're real viruses that uh, infect our, uh, our society. Let me, let me just add a couple Please. of points to that. You know, I, I completely agree with everything you said, Miguel. I think the, the other thing I would want to put on the table is mm -hmm. I'm Mexican-American. And, and so I grew up with a lot of, um, of what your, your, the person who asked the question, what they were talking about. But I think it's very, there's two things I think that are important. It's important for us, for each of us to get in touch with our own stories and our own journey and our mm -hmm. own experience of bias. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of bias against me because I am Mexican American. And there is a social construction of the race of the Mexican. It's not just xenophobia. It is a racial construction, a social racial construction, especially in our country, right now against the Mexican-American. And I think as Mexican-Americans, as Latinos, we need to get in touch with that reality in this country. And then it can help us to create bridges between our experience and the Black Lives Matter movement, which we need to do. And I also want to say that white supremacy, um, it, 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 it runs on uh, an idea from, I'm, I'm borrowing this from um, uh, Foucault. He talks about a panopticon, which means that the center is seeing itself in relationship with all these different groups, but it tries to destroy relationships between and among the groups. And that's another way that racism flourishes in our country, racism against each of our groups because we don't have alliances with one another. And it's important for me to understand the story of black racism in the United States. And it's important for African-American people to understand the story 
of Mexican racism in the United States. Absolutely. And we need to understand what happened with the Japanese internment camps here in the state of California and where the Vietnamese experience. So my point is, we have to know one another's stories because if we don't, we will never dismantle this virus of racism in our country. It has many faces and we need to appreciate that. Amen. Thank you both. Actually, I, I, I've been asked to just sneak one last question in here. So, um, and this question is, um, how do I genuinely continue belonging or signing up for a church that hides behind man-made doc doctrine to not ordain women fails to recognize the dignity of our LGBTQ siblings? Tough one, right? Um, that's a very tough question. Um, and one that many of us face on a daily basis, right? Because we walk into uh, places that are supposed to be inclusive uh, spaces. And instead of inclusion, we oftentimes uh, both feel and experience rejection. And so um, this is not the, the mantle of Guadalupe who, who welcomes. It is instead uh, something that you're not called dignified uh, so-and-so, but you are actually rejected because of, you know, of your humanity. And so um, I, I don't know how to answer that question except to say that it has been for me as well as for others that I know an ongoing struggle to, to negotiate that which has been so wonderful, beautiful, and grace-filled in my life that has come from the church and that which has not been so great filled, but in fact has caused so much pain, oppression and rejection. And so um, it's an ongoing um, struggle and, and, and juggling and finding times when, well, I, this is way too much. I, I need to step away and, and breathe, you know, um, um, breathe from brothers and sisters, breathe from people like, uh, like those that we are, you know, those that will support a more inclusive vision in line with, you know, with Jesus's mission. Um, and then, you know, and then it's sort of like going to the, to the, um, you know, to the, to, to, to restore one's uh, life and health and then be able to, to be strengthened by that so that we can go back into, you know, and, and face these, these, these kinds of challenges. You know, I don't know who the person was, but clearly, um, I just want to say that, you know, whoever you are, you are not alone, um, that there are um, people like myself and others who struggle with those same kinds of, of issues and have to, you know, to, to really on a daily basis wrestle with, with all these wonderful things that have made me who I am as a theologian, as a Catholic, as a human being, and those not so wonderful things like heterosexism, like racism, that are well and alive within our households and within uh, the churches that we are part of. And, and I think this is an ongoing, really uh, a struggle and, 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 and one sometimes that, that um, you know, just requires ongoing discernment and, and, and really support from, from those voices that uh, will offer that presence of grace that all of us need in our lives, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would add to that, that I think, I think this calls, you know, that what your experience, I appreciate the question as well. And it's something, as like Miguel said, uh, that I myself struggle with it, especially as a woman, especially as a woman of color in the Catholic Church. I, I think I'm going to go back to something that happened a little earlier in our conversation. Miguel was challenging us to take responsibility, to learn what the Vatican, what, what Pope Francis is publishing and to make it our responsibility not to wait for a bishop or the local parish priest or whoever to, to educate us about this, but to take that into our own hands. And I think that there's wisdom in that for this very question. I think we need to have a kind of sense in our minds of a dual belonging because our God is a God of life. Yes, so yes. how do I stay inside this church? How am I faithful? But yet I also need my soul filled. I need my spirit to be uh, brought to life in a full way. So can I have, in a sense, a dual kind of belonging to my parish, 
which maybe in some ways is not all that I'm looking for in terms of what feeds my soul. And to other like uh, another community on the side, on the margins of like-minded Catholics who see the world similar to the way that I do, where I can have my, my, my soul fed because we share in a, a, a desire for a more just church that recognizes the gifts of women, that recognizes the LGBTQ community, that recognizes um, people of color, celebrates our African American and our Latino leaders. Um, we, we need all of that and to recognize that the popes and the bishop uh, and the bishops are not the only people who define this church. Absolutely. We, I also involved in defining what it means to be church. And so is Miguel. I'm not preaching a gospel of anarchy here, okay? We're not going to an anarchy. But I am saying there are ways that we need to pay attention to what we feel inside. And we need to take that seriously, very seriously. And, and we need to act on it. And we need to have a foot in two worlds. You know, I, I was just, I, 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 I reached behind me for one of the books. So this is one of the studies that was done on Our Lady of Charity, and it's, it's titled uh, Our Lady of the Exile. The reason, why I'm bringing up, I'm, the reason why I'm bringing up that title is that, you know, maybe it's like this is part of the Cuban drama um, in Saga. <laughs> all of us, all of us, <laughs> honestly, I, 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 I think that in some ways my exile began literally with the exile from the island. And then, and then from that point on, I find myself in a permanent exile with respect to politics, with respect to the church, with respect to the institutions that I'm part of. And, and, and it's not, it's not, you know, I, it, it causes a lot of suffering. So let yeah. me just be very, very blunt because mm -hmm. to remain part of what you just stated, Nancy, and not just say, you know what, I don't want to be an egg, I don't want to be have this exilic experience anymore. I literally, I just want to like, leave and start a new and, and, and do something yeah, no, totally no. different. Um, but, but to be an exile, to be in this condition of exile is to have that, that ambiguity constantly. Yeah. And it's not, you know, like I said, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I, I, I do think that, that um, what is needed and you just stated one, yes, the prophetic kind of dimension that says the whole, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, and that spirit speaks through each one of us. And two, we need to seek support in, in community so that we can be strengthened to continue to do the kind of work that we do um, and not be stopped by the powerful forces um, that cross various uh, uh, institutions and, and, and realities in our lives so that we really can do God's work whenever God wants us to do whatever we can to offer our hands, our eyes, and our ears uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of, uh, you know, of, of, you know, of our fellow humanity, of our siblings uh, in the one family of God. Absolutely. This has been a, I completely agree. This has been a wonderful experience of dancing with you once again, Nia. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is finally revealed. Yes. <laughs> it was me. It was Except me. there was no, you know, this is the thing that we were there and remember that the beautiful palm trees right yes. out from the Caribbean Sea and, 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 the, and the beautiful pool. That was just a totally different experience than the one now where we yes. have <laughs> distance, we, you know, as a, as a sign of care uh, for one another and for and for all those we love um and so yeah that was a that, that was a really a great evening that we uh we had in san juan um as as we danced the night away uh with Absolutely. our yeah. and so we've done great. it again tonight <laughs> we've done it again well, tonight it, it's been my pleasure to serve as your dj tonight and uh <laughs> And, uh, and please, everyone, uh, we, we aren't able to applaud as we normally do, but join me in thanking uh, Ambassador Miguel Diaz and Professor Nancy Pineda Madrid in sharing their thoughts with us tonight. Thank you so much, Miguel, Nancy. And thank you, audience, for being with us, uh, for, for celebrating this time with us, for asking your hard questions, and for uh, engaging in this dialogue, which is the lifeblood of our faith. So, and good night. Thank you. Thank you.